So glad you're joining us today, whether you're at one of our locations or online. Glad you're spending part of your day here. Um, as we get going, I just want to acknowledge uh, that this is obviously Memorial Day weekend. And as a veteran myself, I just want to extend my thoughts and prayers. Uh, for those of us in the room that maybe Memorial Day, um, you have uh, lost a friend or family member. And uh, I just want to know that um, my prayers are yours uh, this weekend. And, uh, and to remind all of us that it is a gift of God's grace that he has provided a place where we can worship freely and that a means of that grace of God to us is through uh, people who are willing to go. And so I just wanted to say thank you from me uh, to you as you remember uh, this weekend. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you. It was very kind. Um, this morning we are going to conclude our He Gets Us series. And as we've been walk walking through this one, we've been looking at a particular doctrine, and that is the incarnation. In that, Jesus came and he added to his divinity humanity. That Jesus lived a very real human life, that he wasn't pretending that all the things that you and I experienced, he experienced because he came and took on this flesh with us so he knows. He knows what it's like. He gets us. And so for you and I, when we have hard days and the stress and the anxiety of what we're going through, he gets us. When we have family conflict and things aren't going well at home, Jesus gets us. When we have times where we would rather avoid the day that's coming and can't sleep and are on our faces, Jesus gets us. When we have our words twisted by people thrown back in our face, we're made to look like the bad guy. Jesus, in fact, gets us. And it's in the incarnation, it's in the person of work of Jesus, that Christianity makes a claim that no other religion makes, no other belief system, no other worldview, in that our God did not stay distant somewhere up there, but God moved into the neighborhood in the person of Jesus. Which means, here's why this is important, for you and I, when we're in the midst of whatever we're going through, you have a God who knows. Not intellectually but experientially. Like when you are stressed, Jesus knows. When you pray and you're the only one in your room and you don't know how it's going to work out, Jesus knows exactly what that feels like. He really does get us. And as we close out our series today, we're going to be looking at a particular aspect of who Jesus was for us in that Jesus was a rebel. Jesus was a rebel. Now, as soon as I say that, I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying, right? What I'm not saying is Jesus was rebellious as from his character. Like Jesus was just going around stirring up controversy, that he just liked to kick the hornet's nest. No, it wasn't a character trait of his, but that at times, because of the circumstance, what Jesus said is, we're going to have to rebel. What Jesus did is he said, no, we're not going to do that. There were times where Jesus said, oh, we're going to push back. My disciples and I, we're not going to play your game. Jesus at times had to rebel. And I also know when I use that term, there's a lot of different ways that we could be processing that right now. Because I know you. I'm one of you. Some of you right now are like, about time. There's a lot of stuff going wrong in the world, and we need some Jesus the rebel time, right? I feel you. Some of us, on the other hand, hear rebel, and we have a different image. We have people who shouldn't be doing what they're doing. They're causing chaos. They're causing havoc. They're the ones that we see on the TV who are ruining cities. That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about a rebel. What I want us to do today is to just look at Jesus. Take whatever we think about being a rebel and what that looks like today or our own definitions. Just put that to the side for a second. And let's look at Jesus. Because when Jesus does something, he does them in a way far better than you and I. 
He does them in a way that reorients our heart towards those things, redefines them such that he brings out what actually is good in the heart of it. And you say, good in the heart of it? Yeah, because as soon as I started to think about, okay, I'm going to talk about Jesus the rebel, I thought about some of the stories that you and I tell in our culture, like this story. Ah, oh, some of you know where I'm going already. Luke and Leia, Han, Chewie, Obi-Wan, R2-D2, C-3PO. What is the group of people that they are a part of? What is called the what? The Rebel Alliance. And I don't know why I said it that way. <laughs> Fighting the Empire like that old trailer voice right there. But no, who are the good guys? The rebels. The rebels are the good guys. How about a more current example? The guardians of the galaxy. I would say guys here, but you got a tree guy and a raccoon. So these individuals. I don't think if you're familiar with these movies that you would say, oh, this is a group of conformists just trying to fit in. No, what are they doing? They're going around the galaxy, apparently guarding it. I'm not so sure about that. Um, but they're certainly rebelling against what they see, are they not? How about this one? Think about how our country came to be. Right? 1700s, the colonists are getting a little tired of King George and his taxes. And so they decide to throw a party in Boston and throw his tea into the harbor. George... We're not going to do your taxes anymore. And they became what? Rebels. Rebels. And so the truth for us is that sometimes being a rebel is a good thing. But sometimes it's a bad thing. Right? Where the rebel just wants to be disobedient for disobedience sake. Just wants to cause havoc and chaos for havoc and chaos sake. Who just doesn't like personally what's going on. And they want to cause trouble. Right? Those rebels need to be arrested. So the question is then for us, if being a rebel sometimes is good and sometimes isn't good, how do you and I know the difference? Because here's the reality. When Jesus was here, he literally overturned tables. When Jesus was here, he literally spoke to institutions and said, you're not right. You are wrong and I will not comply, and we're not going to do it that way. Jesus actually pushed back at times. Now, I'm not saying in that that every issue in the first century Jesus addressed, and he had you know, something to say about it, but he did address the most profound ones, which means what? It means he gets us. He gets us when we have that feeling. It's like, okay, I know I'm going to say something, and all the emotions come right before you start to say that. Jesus gets us when we know what we say or what we're about to say is not going to be received well and there's going to be anger coming the other direction. He gets us, right? Jesus knows what it's like to, if I'm going to push back against this, there's going to be some consequences for me. If you and I ever find ourselves in a position where it's like, no, I'm not going to comply, I'm not going to do that, then Jesus gets us. But again, I have to orient us rightly because there's a lot of places we could go. So here's what we're talking about as we unpack this topic this morning is that being a rebel is not, it's not about taking a political position. That's not what we're saying. Am I saying that we do not participate in politics? No, we do. We participate such as we can. But our goal is not political. The foundation we're standing on is not political. There may be times where our pushback leads to policy, but policy is not the goal. Being a rebel, as we're talking about it, it's about taking a biblical position. It's about standing on God's word. It's about saying in the world that there are authorities, but there's a higher authority. There's things that people say, but there's what God has said. And we are clear 
what our authority is, and on that we stand. That's what we're going to talk about, about being a rebel. So here's the big idea that we're going to unpack in our time together. It's this, that Jesus rebelled against the ideas and practices of the day that were opposed to God and harmful to people. Ideas and practices. Why? Because ideas lead to action. There's an author and speaker, John Stone Street. He likes to say, ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. And so we contend at times in the area of ideas. What kind of ideas do we contend against? Do we push back against those that oppose God and harm people? Those are the places where we say, no, not going to do it. Not going to happen this time. So how? How do you and I, if called upon, rebel rightly? Rebel righteously. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to open to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, we're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to look at a scene in Jesus' life with his disciples where he is having to push back. He is having to rebel. And this is the first truth that we're going to come across. And it's this, that you and I, what are we to do? To do this rightly, to do this righteously is to rebel, to obey God. That what we're going to do is we are going to rebel in order to be obedient to what God has said. So here is Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 1. It says the Pharisees and some teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. And they saw, verse 2, some of his disciples eating with hands that were, quotes, unclean, that is, unwashed. So let's set the stage as we dive into Mark's gospel. Jesus has been preaching. He's been doing ministry. He's been doing miracles. He's been preaching to thousands gathering a crowd doing things that the religious elite, the Pharisees, want to and need to investigate. They're the religious rule keepers, they're the religious authority, and they're the ones that baptize, yes or no, you can speak as a Jew in this country. And so they find out about this upstart rabbi, and they have to investigate. And so it's mealtime, and so they show up and where Jesus is with his disciples, and they're they're looking, they're looking on, and what they see is they don't do, that is, Jesus and his disciples, what they are supposed to do, which is before you eat, you wash your hands. And please, as you, as you hear that, don't think hygiene, right? Don't think like being a good mom or dad. Well, of course you wash your hands before you eat. That's not what the disciples are doing. We know that, or the Pharisees are talking about. We know that because of verses 3 and 4. Look at this. Mark, who is writing to a Roman Gentile audience, puts this parenthetical couple of uh, sentences here to explain the backstory of what's going on so that you and I can get it. He says, verse 3, The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands, and notice this word, a ceremonial washing. Why do they do that? Because they're holding to the tradition of the elders. Verse 4, when they come from the marketplace, note that, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. And so what's going on? Well, in the first century, to be a good Jew is to be a clean Jew. And a clean Jew is one who is not contaminated by uh, dirty Gentiles or other things that can defile them. See, for a Jew, you have to be clean. And when you come in contact with an unclean person, the unclean makes the clean unclean. It's not as if the clean can come in contact with the unclean and the clean make the unclean clean. It's the opposite. The unclean makes the clean unclean. Is that clear? Clear as mud. What are they doing? Well, they're trying to keep themselves ritualistic, easy for me to say, ritualistic pure. Why? Because a good Jew can go to synagogue and a good Jew does the rule following that the Pharisees are putting forth. And Jesus says, we're not going to do that. Why? 
Because notice, they do it ceremonially when they come back from where? From Walmart. When they come back from H-E-B. Because you're a Jew and you got to go get stuff. You have to get groceries. You have to go to the marketplace. And when you're there, you don't know if the vegetable or fruit that you're picking up was touched by a Gentile. You certainly know that the, den- that the Gentile who just gave you your change touched that money. You knew when you were kind of getting through the crowded marketplace that a few of them brushed up against you. So what do you have to do? You have to go home and wash those dirty Gentiles off. That's what you do. What is it that the Pharisees are teaching? Pride, ethnocentrism, racism. So you decide, should Jesus push back? Should Jesus rebel? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's the Pharisees who are going to speak first. Look at verse 5. It says, so the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the, and notice this, the second time we see this phrase, live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands. See, the Jews had the Old Testament. The Jews had the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They had the scriptures. But notice in your text, is that what the Pharisees appeal to? Well, you have to wash your hands because God said. No, that's not what they say. What do they say? They say the tradition of the elders. Well, what's that? Well, over time, the rabbis got together and they came up with this uh, group of teaching called the Mishnah. And what that was is interpretations of God's word, trying to ask and answer, okay, so if this is what God says, like, how do you live it out? And what happened over time is they started paying more and more attention to the tradition of the elders and less and less attention to what God actually said. Eric, how do you know that? Because they're not appealing to what God said here. They're appealing to what they say. And what Jesus is going to say is, no, 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 no. Um, I order my life around obeying God and what he says, not man-made rules. Because man-made rules have a tendency, particularly those that are not based in God's word, to take people away from God and get in the way of people actually coming to faith and knowing God. So guess what? It's time to rebel. And so Jesus responds, verse 6. He says, Isaiah was right. Jesus will quote from the scriptures. He says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. The word there literally means mask wearers. As it is written. These people, these Pharisees, you know what they do? They honor me with their lips. But their hearts? Oh, their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. And then Jesus adds his exclamation point in verse 8. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding to the traditions of men. And Jesus says we're not playing that game. Jesus has to rebel. Why? Because man-made rules will not bring people to God. Why is that important? Because if you and I rebel on the basis of anything other than what God has said, we run the risk of doing exactly what the Pharisees did, which is, why are you doing that? That's my opinion. I just feel like I should. I don't like what's happening. And Jesus is like, no, 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 we're not playing that game either. What we're going to do is we're going to push back on the basis of what God has said. On the basis of what God's word says. You probably know the name Martin Luther, 1500s monk in Germany, who, as he's reading his Bible and looking at what his church tradition is having him do, he's seeing inconsistencies. And because he was a detailed guy, he found 95 of them. And he wrote them down. He called them theses, right? And he tacked them to the door of the local church in Wittenberg. And really, he wasn't trying to cause a fight. He wasn't trying to, like, stir up trouble. He, it, was, it was literally a meeting agenda. 
hey, can we talk about these things? I'm, notice, I'm noticing some, some inconsistencies. Well, you know, it didn't go well, right? You tell the boss he's doing it wrong, eh, good luck with that. And you know, and you probably know about that day when he taxed those 95 on the door. What you might not know is actually a more important day four years later when the religious and political leaders, were, which were pretty intertwined at the time, said, enough of this uh, monk. We're going to call him to the town of Worms in the spring of 1521, and we're going to charge him to recant under the threat of death. Luther, you either stop what you're doing, or we're going to dispatch with you. But Luther goes. And at his trial, so to speak, he says this. He says, unless I'm convinced by Scripture, unless you who are opposing me can show me in God's word where I'm wrong, and, oh, by the way, through plain reason, that that there's something in my thinking that isn't straight, that isn't logical, unless you can convince me there, as Luther, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils. I do not accept the authority of politicians and professors. I do not accept the authority of bureaucrats and bloggers. I do not accept the authority of social media influencers and celebrities. And just to bring it in today's language. You see what I'm saying? For they, these popes and councils, have contradicted each other My conscience is captive to what? What God has said. What God has said. That's what I'm standing, as Luther stands there in front of all his enemies. That's what he he says, the word of God. And then he finishes with this. I cannot and I will not recant. I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. I put the date up there, April 18th, 1521. Because on May 25th of 1521, Luther was labeled a rebel, an outlaw, and a heretic. Now, in both Mark 7 and in Luther's example, they are within the religious sphere. Let me ask this question. What are you and I to do if what we need to push back against at times is in the secular culture around us? And what I could do at this point is I could go in my news feed and cherry pick some headlines. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk us through six examples from you. People that call Hill Country home who have come to me within the last year, year and a half and said, Eric, this has happened. I don't know what to do. Eric, this went on and how should I respond Biblically. And what I'm going to do is as I describe them, I'm going to put you all in the place of the person that I'm talking to. So here's my first example. This happened this past December right over here. Um, I was handing out invite cards to Christmas Eve service at work. My boss called me into her office and told me if I do it again, I'll be fired. What do you do? You're a teacher, and the administration says you will attend this class, Think Continuing Ed, and it has content that directly violates the Word of God. And the connotation within the training, within the class, is that you will accept and promote these ideas that you're being taught. Everyone else in the room seems to be going along with it. No one else is saying anything. What do you do? You're an elementary school librarian. I've talked to two of these in the past year. Here. And the district says you will have these books which contain graphic sexual content in your library. Books an 18-year-old shouldn't consume, let alone an 8-year-old. What do you do? You're a cop. And you are told that you will attend this training. And at this training, this was a conversation this week. At the training, there will be discussion, 
But if you push back against any of the content, you will be reprimanded. What do you do? You work at a company and the yearly HR update, you know, your emergency contact and address, all that stuff comes. And there's some new lines on there. This lifestyle, this lifestyle, this lifestyle. And a new category, are you a supporter? What do you do? This is a good friend of mine. He's like, if I click that box or, I, or more if I don't, am I going to get called into my boss's office in two years? Hey, I noticed that um, you're not a supporter of the other people that work here. Do you know our company values these things? So what do you do? Here's the last one. You work at a company that mandates you use particular pronouns. And you will be disciplined if you don't. What do you do? Like, this is real life. At what point do you say no? At what point do you push back? Now, for a lot of us, like, when this stuff happens, you, like, just, we get put in fight or flight. And I know some of you, you'll fire off that email. You'll let fly. You'll be like, I'll tell you what I think about that. (laughs) Right? I get you. There's a lot of us in flight, though, I think. Why? Well, jobs are on the line. Livelihoods are on the line. My kids are two years away from going to college. Am I going to risk that? Like, what am I going to do? In those moments, please hear me, Jesus gets you. Why? Because in those moments when you're, like, faced with, what, am I going to stand on God's word or am I going to go along? He knows exactly what that feels like. I can imagine Jesus with the disciples in Mark chapter 7. He sees the Pharisees coming, and maybe he's tired that day. He's like, I don't want to deal with these jokers. Guys, go wash your hands. Well, he didn't. But I know I would feel that way sometimes. Here's the other thing that I notice about Jesus. Again, as we look at him to get a picture of what we're talking about, He doesn't try to cancel anybody. He doesn't become a social media activist as if he could. He doesn't lose it on them. What Jesus says is, he says, no, I'm not going to do that. Follow me. That's what he says. Here's the other thing I find amazing about Jesus. He's talking directly to the individual that he has the disagreement with. He doesn't run and do it through an emissary or some other way. He directly goes and talks to the people that, they, that there's conflict with. It's hard. But you and I, on the basis of God's word, are going to have to make decisions and going to have to decide on what we do in certain situations. And please know in those moments that Jesus gets you because he was there. And he faced it too. So if, we, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it based on God's word. And second, we're going to rebel to love others. That our motivation, our heart for people is not to put them in their place or prove that we're right and they're wrong. It's not to get into an argument just for argument's sake. It's love. It's love. So look back at the text, verse 9. Of Mark 7. And he said to them, Jesus goes on, and he's going to give them another example of what they do. He says, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. And then he's going to take them back to God's word. He says, for Moses said, honor your father and mother, the fifth commandment. And anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. That's in Leviticus. Verse 11. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is korban. And then Mark again adds some explanation. That is, what's korban? It's a gift devoted to God. 
Then you, Pharisees, no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Jesus is saying, if I had the time, I can, I've only listed two, the hand washing and Corban. We can go like, boom, you do it here, you do it here, you do it here, you do it here, you do it here. So what's the deal with Corban? Just really quick. Um, think retirement in the ancient Near East. Right? No 401k, no Roth IRA, certainly no Social Security. How are grandma and grandpa supposed to take care of their needs as they age? The fifth commandment. Honor your father and mother. Right? Love them in action. How? Well, grandma and grandpa took care of the kids and grandkids when they were young. And now the kids and grandkids take care of grandma and grandpa. It's a good place for an amen. amen. <laughs> but what the Pharisees had done is they found a loophole way to get around that. Literally, to get around loving and taking care of your family. Here's Corban. You could take your estate or a good portion of it and uh, vow it to the temple. Like when I die, my estate goes to fund the temple. All right? And you know how estates work. While you're still alive, you get to use the resources, yes? And then when your parents come and say, hey, um, we have a need. Could you help us out? Then you have the get-out-of-jail-free card. Well, I'm sorry. It's vowed to the temple. And Jesus says, this is exactly what you do. You are actually getting in the way of loving people. And what I find amazing about Jesus is throughout this interaction, he's not mean, he's not browbeating, he's firm, uh, but he's loving. I don't know about you, but I struggle with that. I struggle with the person that I'm in conflict with not getting amped up, not losing my temper, not wanting to put someone in their place. I struggle. Maybe you do too. And what Jesus says is, no, 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 no. If you're going to rebel my way, you have to rebel my way, which is absolutely loving that the person that you're in conflict with knows that you care about them. So let me tell you about my friend Chris. Lives in the city, former army officer, great guy. Super energetic. He's like the energizer bunny on more energizer batteries. It's a bad example. Um, but he's fired up for Jesus. You can't help but meet Chris and see that Jesus is using him in all these ways. And so Chris is like, wants to see everyone come to faith. And so he builds friendships and relationships all over the place. And not just servicey ones, like, like Chris cares. Like Chris knows, he wants to know what's going on in your life and he'll find out and he'll, he'll dig in with you. He was telling me about a week and a half ago, he meets a friend that um, he's hanging out with and they're, doing stuff with families, and this individual has a different lifestyle than Chris has. That doesn't bother Chris. Why? Because the getting the gospel to this guy is more important than having lifestyle disagreements. But this guy also knows who Chris is because Chris can't uh, help but talk about Jesus. And so one day he comes to Chris and he says, hey, can I see a question? Do you think the way I'm living is wrong? Chris thinks for a second. He says, I believe what God says about what makes for life. And I don't believe you're going to find it through the lifestyle you're living. But I do think you will through Jesus. Conversation ends. It was a little tense, but not bad. A few days later, Chris gets a text. If I come to Jesus, will I have to change? What do you do? Chris says, yep, yeah, but let's talk about Jesus and following him and we'll deal with that next. I think what God is calling us to do in this season and going forward is to do one of the hardest things there is to do, which is like Jesus, be full of grace and truth. Not either or, but 100% grace, 100% love, and 100% truth. That's the standard. And if we are at all honest with ourselves, 
our next response should be, who can do that? Because that's hard. But that's the standard. And if you and I are going to rebel and push back at times, then that's what we have to do for Jesus. And I will say this. I don't think we are ready to push back, we are ready to rebel, unless we're ready to accept the consequences. And not in a way like, I can't believe this is happening to me, and how dare you, da 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 But no, what I'm asking us to do is we have to suffer. The Pharisees, you know this, they will kill him. They kill him. Luther, when he goes to the big you better recant meeting, he knows what could happen coming out of that. And I think the call of Christ on our lives in this season is to be willing to go and to tell the truth and to do so lovingly, not to pick a fight, not to put people in their place. But we can't love people by hiding. We actually have to engage. And so you wonder, it's like, okay, well, I would like to do that more effectively. How? I would say through equipping and transformation. Here's what we've added ministry-wise here at our church in the past couple of years. Colson Fellows Program. What it's designed to do is a deep dive. Think like executive MBA kind of thing into culture, worldview, biblical theology so that you and I can know, I did it two years ago, Here's what the the culture is saying. Here's what the opinions are. Here's what the arguments are. Here's what the Bible says so that I know how to engage profitably, winsomely with those who disagree with me. Why? So that I can actually get into conversation, share truth, and share love. If we're never having conversations, how do we move the gospel forward for those who need it? And the second thing I would say is transformation. That when it comes to being a rebel, what I know about you and I know about me is I know how to be a rebel. Why? Because I was born one. Like I'm a straight sinner, right? I was born rebelling against God. God, I know better. I know how to live my life. But God didn't allow my rebellion to keep me from him. And so he sends Jesus. Who saw through my rebellion and brought me to himself and began to reshape my heart and to reshape how I think and reshape how I treat people. Because in and of myself, I can't do anything of what I just asked us to do. But in Jesus is possible. And so for those of us who need just that next step of transformation, just let me remind you, right, the two truths that make you a Christian, that one, you are more sinful than you'd ever dare to imagine, but in Jesus, you are more loved than you'd ever dare to hope. That when Jesus comes and he dies on the cross, he doesn't just die for sin in general, he dies for my sin in particular. And nothing less than the death of the Son of God on my behalf was sufficient to get me back into a relationship with God. That's what it took. But as Jesus does it, he does it because he wants to. He looks way off into the distance and he sees you, he sees me. For that man, for that woman, I'll lay my life down. And he says, do you want to come? And when you and I become transformed by that truth, man, there's no telling what God can do. And in a season like we find ourselves in now, sometimes having to rebel on the basis of what God has said and with nothing but love for those that we're interacting with. And so that's the challenge and the opportunity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your grace and your love and your word. Thank you that in Jesus, what's impossible for us is possible for you. I pray for my own heart, my brothers and sisters, that we'd be a group of people who um, are so rooted in your word that it just comes out of us. 
and so transformed by love that that's what people see. We trust you that you've got us and that you're going to carry us forward by grace. I know what God's people said. Amen. Amen.